this event is totally student run from planning to production to execution. And today we're in for a treat because our theme for today is start with a yes and it's going to focus on the one thing that we have constant in our lives every day and that is change. Our students and uh, a couple of our teachers are going to be sharing with you today their thoughts and ideas on change, and it's starting with a yes. And so without any further ado, let's get started with TEDx Youth Event. <laughs> We inspire, we challenge, we innovate, we care. With an ever-changing society and ever-changing norms, we only need to start adapting to them. This comes with a simple act of saying yes. In this way, we are constantly growing and making a change for the better. Today's modern environment urges us to be free-spirited and open-minded towards ideas as time and tide wait for no one. The very same is applied to scientific and technological advancements in our society that have happened, are happening, and will happen. These advancements need only be ideas. Ted's motto is to spread ideas worth sharing. And today's event, through today's event, the speakers will directly address the impacts of a positive idea, that is, saying yes. For these reasons, the theme of today's event is start with a yes. It, is, it inspires the youth to take on challenges and face new endeavors. The subsequent topics will be discussed. Culture, globalization, modern society, pop culture, advancement and innovation, and youth empowerment. Start with a yes aims to impel today's youth to grow and integrate into a worldwide network of ideas that will one day be a part of a change. This event has been independently organized by the students of GAA. Out of respect to the speakers, I would like to request the audience members to please silence your phones and refrain from any flash photography. Also, as this event is being live streamed, I would like to request you to wait until we are between speakers if you must leave the auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to TEDx Youth at GAA. I hope this experience inspires and encourages you to start with a yes. Our first speaker for the day is Omar Akhtash. He is a grade 10 student and today he will be talking about technology and its, its advancements over time. Please put your hands together for Omar. Have you ever sat down and asked yourself, what is innovation? What does this word really mean? Well, a really simple definition is that innovation is a new idea. Take a look around you. Everything you see came from innovation. A curious mind who once questioned, what can I do better? How can I impact the human race? Can I make this task any easier? Our sincere audience, I would like for us to direct our complete attention to this video that was put out by a very prestigious and a very well-known tech company, the Boston Dynamics. This, the title of this video is Robot Dog. Take a look. Now I know what you might be thinking right now. Either this is really cool or it's really terrifying. Personally, I thought it was terrifying. But we cannot be driven away from how fascinating this really was. I mean, this is a huge leap and advancement in our technology. Every once in a while, a new technology, an old problem, and a big idea turn into innovation. A quote by a very famous American inventor and engineer, the inventor of the Segway itself, Dean Kamen. Now, what this quote does is it clearly describes the algorithm of innovation and how inventions occur. Think of it as a really simple math problem. You have a new technology plus an old problem plus a curious mind, which really is the key to this entire problem, and you will get innovation. Now, you might be asking yourself, why is it so important for me as an individual 
to keep up with all these technologies. Can I just live the old way? Will it impact me in any way? Well, the answer to your question would be both yes and no. You can choose to live the vintage or the old way, or you can choose to keep up with all these technologies. The smarter answer, definitely the second one, keeping up with all these technologies. I mean, would you want to go to work on a horse? Yes, it sounds intriguing, but let's think about this for a second. Where are you going to park that horse? Who's going to look after it? Or let me give you a better example. Would you prefer to do your laundry by hand rather than using a washing machine and a dryer? Keep that in mind. In contrast, nowadays, everything is based off of and run by some sort of technology. Your workplace, for instance, your workplace almost 100% uses some sort of computer. Your mobile phone, you use it to send messages, apply for jobs, check what the weather is like, or checking, for, or check the, checking the traffic in your area. Your car. You use your car to go to work, going out with friends, or going shopping. All these technologies have simply made our lives easier in every field imaginable. That's why one should keep up with them. Now, technology has had numerous positives on our lives. And to keep it simple and short, we'll use one positive. That is that technology has allowed us to do work more efficiently. Let's take a, a good look at this example. Agriculture, 200 years ago, Agriculture was completely manual, from churning the ground, planting the seeds, and watering them. Later, during the agricultural revolution, John Deere invented the iron plow, which made agriculture somewhat more mechanical. Nowadays, agriculture is completely mechanical. Tractors and water sprinklers are just two of the many tools used in agriculture. Although technology has had numerous positives on our lives, we all know the saying, with every positive comes a negative. That's right, a negative. In the case of technology, there are two negatives. One is on a more personal level, and the other is on a global scale. War and our social lives. Now, let me clarify something. War is, or technology is not a direct cause to war. However, our huge leap in advancement in, in technology has allowed us humans to invent weapons of mass destruction that could easily lead our population to extinction. A really good example of this, World War II. The World War II had an estimated 50 to 80 million casualties. Now, try to imagine this for a second. If a third World War, God forbid, were to occur nowadays, how many casualties do you think we'd have? Those numbers would easily triple and probably quadruple. I mean, we have really advanced nuclear warfare nowadays. Secondly, our social lives, and I'm sure at least most of us have experienced this. People are not as social as they used to be. Nowadays, you see people walking down the street, head tilted down, staring at their phone, and paying no heed to what is going on around them, or greeting whoever they pass by. Kids, kids are addicted to their video games, and are definitely not as active as they used to be 10 or 15 years ago. And in return, this has played out on their health. I mean, diabetes, obesity is, is normal for kids now. Overall, the positives outweigh the negatives. Technology is an essential, and it's rising at a very shocking speed. A really good example of this, the 20th century. During that era, we humans invented helicopters and airplanes, the World Wide Web, the internet, credit cards, advancements in medicine, and most importantly, we made it to space and landed on the moon. Our current era, the 21st century, is also an excellent time for innovation. Take the UAE Mars 2117 mission, for example, a mission that's one of its kind. And as an individual, what you could really learn from this is keep the door for all possibilities open, no matter what people have to say. The mission that the UAE wants to colonize Mars by the year 2117, 99 years from now, yes, 99 years from now, and build the very first city on there. Now, if that project is successful, you may ask, you will have the entire world scrambling just to keep up with such a huge leap in advancement and innovation. Technology and innovation is essential. It will always find a way to improve our lives by increasing the efficiency within it while decreasing the flaws. One must always keep in mind and remember that technology will reach to a certain point that we as humans right now cannot imagine. I mean, for all we know, a war between humans and ro robots may break out one day. 
Our dear valued audience, I just want you to keep one thing in, in mind and always remember, I hope you're listening carefully to this. If you have an idea or you're ambitious about something and you think you could bring about innovative revolution in this world, go for it. For all you know, you may be the person to bring about a cure for cancer. An idea can turn into dust or magic based on the talent that rubs against it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. That was a very informative and eye-opening speech. Now our second speakers are Adam Binu and Ibrahim Uzbek, 11th graders in our school who will be talking about culture and counterculture. Counter Let's welcome them onto the stage. Pop culture. We all follow it. We're all affected by it either subconsciously or willingly. The things we do, the people we follow, down to the foods we eat, are all influenced by society and the changes that occur within it. Society has gone through countless changes, both culturally and historically. And these changes then affect the people that are living within the society. However, this acclimatization to the change is almost subconscious. It is easy to do what everyone else is doing, to see the outcomes of their decisions be it good or bad, we get to then form our own decisions. However, if it does not work, we're able to turn to the millions of other people doing the same things as us. And because of this, we can infer that pop culture does not cause any change in society. And through this quote, he shows the same sentiments. He states that pop culture is a reflection of social change, not a cause of social change. And through this, he's trying to show that to see society, all you need to do is see pop culture. For, for example, if you want to see the type of music people are listening to, just turn on the radio. Or what kind of clothes people are wearing, just go into a shopping mall. However, through saying that is not a cause of social change, is not to detract from the amount of power that pop culture has in today's society. So before we move on, I'd like to talk about what pop culture is. So pop culture, or popular culture, is the, product, is the sum of television, literature, fashion, arts, and food that is consumed by the youth and or majority of society today. I'm sure many of you here in the audience today follow many of the trends that pop culture have, has created. I myself am a product of pop culture. In this digital age where information is so easily accessible, whether it be through the internet or various other mediums that it chooses to convey itself through. The way in which I see the world is molded in accordance to the current state of society. So, how does pop culture influence us? It influences our personalities, the people we choose to associate with, and the way we speak. Almost all aspects of life can be attributed to pop culture. Now let's look at pop culture in action. How many of you, by a show of hands, know who this man is? OK, we have a few hands in the audience. So for those who don't know, this is Kanye West. He's a famous singer, rapper, and entrepreneur in this day and age. As of the past year, Kanye West has been one of the biggest contributors to pop culture. He became so idolized that his fans would do anything to be somewhat involved with him, whether it be through his music, which already had such a large following, or now, currently, through his fashion line. This pedestal that people put him on gave Kanye the power to influence change, to influence the way people perceive things and their opinions. Though, however, this wasn't his goal. But because of pop culture, this is what it has come to. Now, let me come back to Kanye in a minute. Let's look at this. This is the Adidas Ultra Boost. It's a running shoe that was created by Adidas for the purpose of running. And the general uh, response that was, received by the, that was received from the sneaker community was ugly, not modern, and my dad would wear that. No offense to any dads in the audience. So, overall, the general response was negative. But then, what happens next is as follows. Kanye West decided to wear the Ultra Boost. After this, I'm sure a lot of you can guess what happened. The market for the Adidas Ultra Boost skyrocketed. These became one of the most sought-after sneakers on the market, 
and everyone who regarded them as ugly were now the ones who wanted to own them the most. Because of this, it created a wave of shoes of this nature to be regarded as high, fa high fashion and fashionable for the youth and the majority of society. Here are some examples of designers that have done their own take on shoes of this nature that are now regarded as top of the sneaker hierarchy. Here's Balenciaga, Yeezy by Kanye West, and Gucci. The point we are trying to make is that pop culture has such a great hold on us. It, manip it manipulates us in a, weather, in a way whether we choose to be manipulated or not. It is safe. If we choose not to be judged, we should choose pop culture. If we want to be accepted, we would also look to choose pop culture. Yet this then leads to a lack of imagination, a lack of originality within our thought process, us just following the path that society has paved for us. We choose to follow these trends that pop culture has created because we feel that if we follow them, we're accepted. Yes, it's easy, and yes, it's safe, but it's not always who we are. And that brings us to our next point. As for many people, they may choose pop culture because they genuinely believe in the ideas that it possesses. Yet this is not necessarily true for all, as many people may be pressured to follow these ideas because other people are doing them also. Yet not everyone is like that. There are people that think outside of the box, drawn by society. People that, they, there may be people that stream their music on Spotify, yet there are also people that listen to classical music on vinyl record players. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of counterculture. So counterculture opposes the trends of mainstream society. Pop culture may encourage people to idolize different forms of media, whereas counterculture will encourage people to go against what is popular, to forge their own path with new ideas. Some examples of this uh, may be hipsters, vegetarians, or the rock and roll movement, all who have made very significant changes. And to go against this tide that is pop culture is very important, as going against something as powerful as culture can end up being something powerful in itself. One of the largest examples that we see in today's society of counterculture can be said to be the hipster movement. This is a large group of people embracing something different on purpose for the sole reason of going against what is popular. They dress in a certain way, eat certain foods, and listen to a distinct type of music, all facets that compose culture. Yet they are all specifically curated for them to go against what society has said for them to do. It's them trying to find new ideologies, a new path with their values even resonating with past subcultural movements within the United States. So after looking at these two sides, pop culture and counterculture, it got us thinking. What if one didn't exist or one ceased to exist? Let's take a scenario for example. What if counterculture didn't exist at all? Wouldn't then pop culture just be culture? This brought us to a conclusion. That pop culture and counterculture are both interdependent. In order for one to thrive, the other needs to exist. And this made us realize something. If everyone had the same opinions, choices, political views, etc., then there would be no such thing as innovation. What do I mean by that? Well, if everyone saw eye to eye and had the same preferences, then we wouldn't see a need to make a change, or I should say, improve what we have today. And this class of cultures is extremely important. It allows the ideas of different people from different backgrounds to bounce off of each other, eventually allowing for the advancement of society. What we want you to take away from this presentation is that whether you're associated with pop culture or counterculture, they're both two important cogs that are present in the machine that is society. So do not be afraid to open your mind to new ideas or to follow a path that not many other people are taking. Say yes to change. Because it's the ones that are different that make a difference. Thank you very much. My name is Adam Binu. And my name is Uri Mosbeck. Thank Thanks. You. Great job, guys. We obviously know who will be setting future trends into motion. Now, welcome Hannah Butt, a grade 10 student who will be talking about youth empowerment through her own experiences. Thank you very much. Welcome her.
Growing up, I hated it when the white, tall, blonde, skinny, blue-eyed girl would say to me, be you and don't be afraid of fitting in or falling under peer pressure. She and others throughout my entire life had involuntarily taken the legitimate meaning out of that advice. Because think about it, the white blonde girl, surrounded by a bunch of other white kids, telling the only brown chubby curly haired girl that hey, it's easy to fit and be yourself. This had no meaning to me because I never had any living proof that being comfortable with who I was was even possible. So I spent my childhood trying to be like everyone else and I never succeeded until I finally embraced who I was. I moved a lot as a kid. I was born in San Jose, California. A year later, my family and I moved to Toronto. Six years later, we moved to Massachusetts. Six years later after that, we moved to Abu Dhabi. And we've been in Abu Dhabi for almost two years since my freshman year of high school. Obviously, I don't recall anything in San Jose. I was just a baby. However, I definitely remember Toronto. Every Sunday, my parents and I would take the drive down to Scarborough and drop me off at Sunday school at Nugget Mosque. After the last prayer, at the end of the day at school, I'd meet my cousins Raf and Mar, and we'd stop by Tim Hortons for Tim Bits and Ice Caps on the way home. Then we'd spend the rest of the day at their house, roughhousing, playing basketball, and just joking around, having the time of our lives. Having that swing and routine with my family is what made us click. Fighting and playing with my cousins had become so second nature and familiar that it broke down the walls of distrust and awkwardness that lingers when meeting a stranger. Toronto, to me, was the definition of fun. But at times, loneliness haunted me. I went to a school that wasn't really diverse and had really idiotic kids that viewed the brown chubby curly haired girl as weird. Now I look back and see how adorable I was with my pigtails and cute outfits that dad always put on me. But then I would get really upset when people made fun of my authenticity and my different name. To be honest, at some points I was ashamed by who I was. My cousins were my closest friends in Toronto and leaving them was really hard. It was just the four of us starting fresh in our new house an hour outside of Boston. We spent the summer every day in the pool, but summer came to an end and starting at a new school was the scariest thing ever for a little kid. Just to be clear, my family and I are all Muslim. Now, we don't pray five times a day every day, but we are conservative. So when I went back to school shopping, I was never allowed to buy shorts above the knee or tank tops. However, those personal standards were contradicted every day at school, and I was only girl not wearing shorts above the knee and tank tops. And every day, I wished to be like the white skinny girls. I wished I had their straight hair, and I wished to be like all the other girls who went to the mall with their friends without their parents. But I was never like them, no matter how hard I tried. No matter how many times I tried to straighten my hair and get as straight as the white girls, I never could. There was always something about me that stopped me from ever fitting in. At the time of the move from Massachusetts to Abu Dhabi, I thought life sucked since I was leaving my best friend Diana. I've known Diana for almost six years and she was someone I never wanted to lose contact with. And at the time, I was afraid of losing her. We clicked because we were able to vent and relate about the ridiculous norms, both physical and social at school, while still competing and helping each other out with our precious academics. She was, is, and will always be my best friend. When I had told everyone I was moving to go to Abu Dhabi, no one even had a clue where I was talking about. So to help uncomplicate things, I just said the Middle East. The reaction to that was, oh my gosh, you're gonna die and I'm never gonna get to see you again. Everyone had this very fake picture of the Middle East that is just a very undeveloped, third world, deserted, unstable war zone. Like, it is stereotyped in the US. But the Middle East in Abu Dhabi is completely different. So my family and I packed up our things and left the US. Moving to a place where there are a lot of brown people already made me fall in love with Abu Dhabi. Moving to a Muslim country was a dream come true, so I never felt awkward when I was wearing conservative clothing. When starting school, I assumed I'd be the new girl at school and finding the, the nerdy girls like me. But no, I got along with everyone. Everyone was so nice and welcoming and came and talked to me, so I thought, Maybe high school isn't all that bad. Maybe there's no such things as clicks. Maybe watching Mean Girls did not explain everything in life after all. But I was wrong on so many things. Some not in a bad way. Be 
being the science math person that I am, I can't help but mention at least one math analogy. I'm hoping the majority of the people here know what asymptotes and functions are. Well, the definition of a function is that a function is a function if and only if. For every x value, there is only one unique y value. Each and every person in this room is an x value, and each one of us possesses a different y value. The problem is that, as humans, we wish to be like each other. And when this occurs, we reach an asymptote. An asymptote is a boundary on a graph that a function comes close to but never touches. That line is the imaginary picture we all refer to as perfection. That perfection holds all the physical, social, political, and economic standards that we view as perfect. Everyone wishes and tries so hard to reach the asymptote, but no one ever succeeds. No one ever succeeds because the asymptote is just a boundary. It is not part of the function. We are the function, and we need to realize that we will never be happy with our y value that describes who we are inside and out until we accept the fact that the asymptote is just a boundary, and it never will exist. Now, if my math teacher, Mr. Otto, were here, he would not be impressed, like I'm sure all of you are. Because my amazing analogy only gives you an ultimatum without a solution. Mr. Otto is all about solutions, and thanks to him, we have an answer. The thing about asymptotes is that they limit you as a function, but you can still grow. So instead of striving to reach a value in the asymptote, you climb the asymptote, and you continue to grow and learn until you reach the top of your game. But you'll never fully feel that satisfaction of reaching the top of your game until you forget the asymptote and stop searching for something that doesn't exist and instead be the best you that you can be. My first day of school, I met a few people who, turns out one was also from Boston. The next thing you know, that day consisted of a bunch of people coming up to me and asking, you're Hannah from Boston, right? You're so cute, I love your hair. Here, let me show you where your next class is. And a bunch of other kind and hilarious things to say to the clueless new girl. Getting the few compliments at school was kind of foreign to me. And when that happened, I got overly excited and ahead of myself. I thought I was popular and that people noticed me because I was now pretty. I thought, this is my chance. This is my time to have a bunch of friends and to walk in the hallway and say hi to all the people that would acknowledge my presence. I was so excited in being liked and a social butterfly that I neglected to see the catch for being Miss Social. First semester of my freshman year was when I was introduced to drama, cliques, and everything else that I never wanted to be a part of. Second semester was when I, was in, when I became involved in the drama. A few weeks after that ridiculous rumor gossip, I was really confused, nervous, and clueless as to what I should do. Should I remove myself out of this environment? Should I just counter every smart remark and mistaken question that comes my way? I just didn't know. So I decided to lay low and eat lunch with my math teacher until spring break came so I could recuperate from this awakening of what high school is really like. My questions were answered with the help of my family since no matter what, they are my number one. I ignored the mistaken questions and sly remarks from peers and started to very slowly and carefully find the right friends again. Patience and awareness was key when finding the right friends again. I was very cautious of what I said around everyone because I just didn't know who to trust. The right friends are not the good or bad people, no. They're the people who I clicked with and who were right for me. I eventually found friends who I trusted and clicked with. I found Hodger. Hodger is my best friend. We bonded because we were able to relate and, no, we were able to, we were both gigantic nerds with ridiculously protective parents, crazy families, and we both believe that equality and feminism is pretty cool. Hodger was someone who stood out to me and who I clicked with. And thankfully, I clicked with someone who surrounds herself with her people. They are Jessica, Lilia, Carolyn, Maya, and Victoria. They are the people who I vent and joke around with, and most importantly, who I am my completely goofy, nerdy Hannah self with. As for Diana, she, t she still calls me at 2 a.m., sadly, to talk about mom, school, and soccer. And Hodger is still the only sane person who will ever get my Disney movie references. It seems simple. But the best things in life are simple. 
They are so simple and rare that it takes a lot, a lot of work and patience to finally dig out the gold. I found my gold. There has been a war between me and being myself in such a judgmental society for so long. I never wanted to fully come clean and admit this confusion because as adolescents, we are always taught what's in the past is over and it's time to focus on the now. But why should we forget the past if that is how we figure out how to handle the future? Why move on to the next challenge if one can't even admit defeat and learn from their mistakes? Well, the answer is we can't ever be perfectly capable of progressing through the now if the past is neglected, but not anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, I won this war because I'm happy and I'm proud of who I am. Of course, I still care about what people think of me, but I do not let anyone dictate who I am anymore. And that's the important part. While I have won, many youths and teens today are in the midst of fighting their battles and have yet to win because they're afraid of losing friends, looking like a loner, and not fulfilling society standards. But they shouldn't because take it from someone who spent a lifetime looking for approval and acceptance, there is none. No matter how much you do, you will never be good enough for society. Ask any celeb, plus size model, or skinny model. They can all attest to the fact that there are, that there are always critics and haters in the world that will never be pleased with who you are. So do yourself a favor and stop looking for acceptance because there just isn't any. And learn from my mistakes. And learn from your mistakes. And use the, don't hide from them. Accept them and use them as a guide for the future. Don't change who you are to fit in. Be different and be comfortable in your own skin because there is always someone out there to accept who you are. You just have to be patient and strong enough to find them. I will never forget this war. I'll carry it with me. So when I leave Abu Dhabi, I'll carry these lessons from my past right next to me and open the answer key that lies next to all of us, waiting to be liberated from this rejection. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was very empowering. Now, Hanif Lawal, who is an eighth grader here, is going to usher us towards the way to building a better future. Please welcome Hanif. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and today I'll be talking about building a better tomorrow. If one person has the ability to make the future promising, then we can only imagine what a group of people can do. It is really easy for us to just imagine a promising future. But the only way it will ever become reality is to start building it, piece by piece. While every single one of us has the natural ability to make the world a better place, we refuse to use our individual talents. What we don't understand as a society is that by choosing to improve the future, we're actually benefiting ourselves and other members of society. One way that we improve ourselves by improving the future is we can get drive from the impact that we have, the positive change that we create, and it can motivate us to continue to persevere in other aspects of life. Another thing, we can also improve the lives of a lot of people by improving the future, because you never know, one day, those people you helped may help you out too. As Nelson Mandela said, we can change the world and make it a better place it is in your hands to make a difference. Now, we're start, we start to think that our efforts are too small or too ineffective and that there's no point in doing them, that we might as well just give up. But we have to continue. What we don't understand is by just making effort, we're actually helping to build a better tomorrow. And we're, not benefiting, we're only benefiting ourselves and our society. We don't understand that our hard work may motivate, you never know who your hard work may motivate or inspire to join in in building a better tomorrow. As APG Kalam said, let us sacrifice our today so that our children have a better tomorrow. 
And sometimes we encounter setbacks. Sometimes we fail. And it doesn't feel nice. But we all know from experience that failure is normal. And it happens all the time. And those who are the most successful are able to use those failures, those mistakes, and build up from them to get better each and every single time. And that's what we need to learn. And that's what we need to teach. We have to continue. Because failure is normal. We can't give up. For it is our collective responsibility to make the world a better place. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And we as a society have to learn that we have to keep moving forward, to keep persevering through any of the challenges we face in order to improve the future in whatever way we can. Now to make the future better, we have to do some things. One, we have to sacrifice. We have to sacrifice and have the mental ability to know what to sacrifice in order to make the world a better place. We also have to work hard. We have to work hard to the best of our mental and physical capability to try to improve the world in whatever way we can. And finally, we have to work smart. We have to figure out ways to be more effective in improving the future. And a way to do this is to work with other people. We all, the, we all know the saying, two heads are better than one. This idea that we're better connected than divided as groups instead of as indivi individuals is simply reality. We need to use our natural talents and resources to help improve the future and learn about the problems hindering our present. Then, by working with other people, we're eventually making our efforts more successful. Now, there was an issue, an issue that affected the future of America, and it was racial discrimination. And it caused lots of problems, such as segregation, violence, and poverty. It gave people reasons to justify inequality for something they could not control. African Americans were stigmatized and treated as if they were not human beings. And this got so bad to the point that hate began to form. And it began to divide communities. And hate and division resulted in violence, war, and bloodshed. But there were more than a group of people who decided to take a look at this crisis, analyze it, and try to figure out ways to resolve it, or at least a small piece of it. And one of the most influential people in actually doing this was Martin Luther King Jr. As Jennifer Hogan said, it only takes one person and one act of kindness to inspire others and create change. You can be that person. You can do that act of kindness. You can inspire others. And you can create change. Now, how did Martin Luther King Jr. do it? How did he be so successful? How did he inspire and change the lives of a lot of people? Well, he was optimistic. He continued to persevere no matter what happened to him so that he could achieve his dream. He believed in the potential of humanity. He worked with other people when his ideas weren't working out and he leaned on them. And this allowed his ideas to expand and diversify. He knew that he couldn't do it by himself, but by joining others, he would be able to improve his present and our future. And an example of this is the election of the first African-American president. This was a really big step. The first African-American president in the United States of America. His name was Barack Obama, and he would have not been elected if not for the efforts of Martin Luther King Jr. and many before and after him. This is only one of the reasons why his speeches, attitude, and virtue are thought around the entire world to motivate them to inspire and create change in whatever way they can. By believing the potential of humanity, Martin Luther King Jr. has shown us the steps to take in, in order to improve our world and its future. As Ashley Brilliant said, nothing we do can change the past, but everything we do changes the future. All these people who decided to create change, they knew that they couldn't change the past. The past was done. They couldn't change that. But what they could do was change their present and inevitably change the future. And they decided to work towards it, which is why America is a better place due to the efforts of Martin Luther King Jr. and many inspired by him and many others. Finally, we have to believe that we are good enough that we can change the world, that we have the ability to make it a better place. 
We're beginning to live in a really pessimistic world, and now we think that we're not smart enough, we're not this, we're not that, but I'm here to tell you that you are good enough to inspire the world and create change. You can change it, and you can make the world positive. We all have the ability to do so, but we have to believe in ourselves, and we have to believe in others. We can't be pessimistic, because it doesn't lead to achievement. We have to learn to be optimistic and teach this attitude to other generations. As Helen Keller said, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope. We won't be able to achieve an equally promising future unless we believe in our ability, that we can step up to the problems others backed away from and do whatever we can to improve our present and its future. Because who else will be able to do it? Who else will be able to guarantee that the future will be promising for new generations, if not you and I? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our next speaker is Mark Bazaz, an assistant captain at a volunteer fire department in New York. Back in New York, I am the head of development for a nonprofit called Robin Hood. When I'm not fighting poverty, I'm fighting fires as the assistant captain of a volunteer fire company. Now, in our town, where the volunteers supplement a highly skilled career staff, you have to get to the fire scene pretty early to get in on any action. I remember my first fire. I was the second volunteer on the scene, so there was a pretty good chance I was going to get in. But still, it was a real foot race against the other volunteers to get to the captain in charge to find out what our assignments would be. When I found the captain, he was having a very engaging conversation with the homeowner, who was surely having one of the worst days of her life. Here it was, the middle of the night. She was standing outside in the pouring rain, under an umbrella, in her pajamas, barefoot, while her house was in flames. The other volunteer who had arrived just before me, let's call him Lex Luthor, <laughs> got to the captain first and was asked to go inside and save the homeowner's dog. The dog! Oh, I was stunned with jealousy. Here was some lawyer or money manager who for the rest of his life gets to tell people that he went into a burning building to save a living creature. Just because he beat me by five seconds. Well, I was next. The captain weighed me over. I said, Bezos, I need you to go into the house, I need you to go upstairs, past the fire, and I need you to get this woman a pair of shoes. <laughs> I swear. So, not exactly what I was hoping for, but off I went. Up the stairs, down the hall, past the real firefighters who were pretty much done putting out the fire at this point, into the master bedroom to get a pair of shoes. Now, I know what you're thinking, but I'm no hero. <laughs> I carried my payload back downstairs where I met my nemesis and the precious dog by the front door. We took our treasures outside to the homeowner where, not surprisingly, his received much more attention than did mine. A few weeks later, the department received a letter from the homeowner thanking us for the valiant effort displayed in saving her home. The act of kindness she noted above all others, someone had even gotten her a pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, in both my vocation at Robin Hood and my avocation as a volunteer firefighter, I am witness to acts of generosity and kindness on a monumental scale. But I'm also witness to acts of grace and courage on an individual basis. And you know what I've learned? They all matter. So as I look around this room at people who either have achieved or are on their way to achieving remarkable levels of success, I would offer this reminder. Don't wait. Don't wait until you make your first million to make a difference in somebody's life. If you have something to give, give it now. Serve food at a soup kitchen, clean up a neighborhood park, be a mentor. Not every day is going to offer us a chance to save somebody's life, but every day offers us an opportunity to affect one. So get in the game. Save the shoes. Thank you.
Our next speaker, Mr. David Allen, he's a history teacher here in GAA. And today he'll be talking about his experiences and how a simple yes can change your life. Please welcome Mr. David Allen. Um, yeah, I'm talking about the word yes, so I think I took the prompt a little too literally, but <clears throat> where I wanted to start is, it's such a simple word. We say yes and no all the time, but yes and no become the narrative of our lives, our major decisions, our minor decisions, what we have for breakfast, um, if we want to carpool, if we want to call in sick that day, if we go to university, if we want to go to Mars. All of these are dictated by yes and no. So. What I thought about was, when we think about yes and no, what's the difference between yes and no? And really it came down to if, then. If I say no, then nothing happens. No becomes comfortable. No is safe. No is status quo. On the other hand, if, then, yes. Yes becomes possibility. See, the difference between yes and no is the difference between impossible. No, and possible, yes. <clears throat> we tell our students, our children, we tell them they can be anything. And often we forget to finish that statement. See, we say, you can be anything you want to be. And I do believe that. But I believe we should tell them a little more. You can be anything, but the first thing you have to do is say yes. <clears throat> if no is safe, if no is comfortable, then yes is exciting. Yes is potential. Yes is exhilarating, but it's also terrifying. It's scary. It's the opportunity to be great, but it's also the first step in the opportunity to fail. Most people will tell you one of the first big yeses they remember in their life is saying yes to going to college or university, but I feel like that's, in a lot of cases, that's not your yes. See, for me, that feeling felt a lot like Tom, or Colin Hanks' character in the 2001 cinematic classic, Orange County, when he answered, because that's what you do after high school. I feel like that's where I went next. And I did it. I went, I got the piece of paper, I worked hard, I had a good time, I walked out of school, and what I didn't realize, because I had never been made to say yes before, was this time I started saying no. Now, my parents said, what are you going to do next? I said, I don't know. My mom said, do you want to go to grad school? I said, no. My dad said, well, how about you go to a vocational school, get a more practical education to go with your degree? I said, no. My dad said, you like history? Why don't you become a history teacher? And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, never. Now, there's an irony to all of this, and I'm going to take a moment here because I think they're going to watch this at some point. One, mom and dad, I'm sorry. And two, you were right. Um, but at some point I decided to say yes. After five years of toiling in other jobs, um, working in industries I knew nothing about, learning, I realized that I had to say yes to me because all of my no's had created a situation where I wasn't making progress. Nothing was happening. Nothing good was happening. Nothing bad was happening. So I said yes. I decided my father was right and I should be a teacher. I applied to teachers' colleges. I applied to about six of them and every single one of them told me no. They told me now with that GPA, and I'll be honest, the GPA that 20-year-old me earned, they should have told me no. But I could have taken their no. That was my one option. My other option was to say yes. I called up one of the schools and I said, what do I need to do? How do I get in? How do I make progress? And they told me what my GPA had to be, and I went back to school. I said yes to more classes. I said yes to hard work. I said yes to being a full-time student and a full-time employee. I said yes to the GRE exam. I said yes to all of it. And that yes, all of those yeses, got me where I wanted to go. At least part of the way to where I wanted to go. Now, once I got into grad school, I went to my boss who I'd worked for for several years, great guy, went into his office and I said, hey, I'm going to go to grad school, here's the schedule that, you know, of my classes. And he said, that's tremendous, uh, you're going to have to find a new job because you can't work here anymore with that schedule. Now, here's another opportunity to say no, because I had insurance, I had bills, I had <clears throat> rent to pay. I had a life at 28 years old that I was trying to finance. So I did what any self-respecting person would do. I went and I looked everywhere for a job, and I got the most glamorous job I could get. I became a janitor. Now, at that moment, 
everybody who's ever said they want to be a janitor? Put your hand up. Mm, not, not a lot? Okay. <clears throat> at that moment, I said yes. Why? Because I could go to work at 4.30 in the morning. I could be out by 12.30 in the afternoon, and I could be in my grad school class by 2 o'clock. <clears throat> Every day, I went to work, went to school, got home at 10 o'clock, did my homework, went to bed, and did it again. But beyond the chasing around herds of barely monitored children who are doing all sorts of things that they would never do at home because their parents weren't cleaning up after them. And I figured out that's why the price of the water park was so high. It had nothing to do with the slides. It had everything to do with the parents saying, that's not happening in my living room. <clears throat> but after months of doing that, and I got my yes, I got an opportunity. It's not easy. Yes isn't easy. You're not supposed to think it's easy. But the path that I had to follow to get me where I'm going <clears throat> led here. But before I could get here, there was one more major yes. Now, I was working on a master's degree. I thought to myself, I got an education. Somebody's going to hire me. This will be tremendous. What I failed to realize is that the international school community doesn't hire in June. <clears throat> They actually hire way back at the beginning of the year or at the end of the following year. So I applied to every job I could find in June of 2012. There was three. One called me back. July 13th, 2012, I took a phone interview with a school in Bahrain. Now, I had to Google it to figure out where Bahrain was. And after two hours, I had a woman say to me, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make you a job offer. It's Thursday night, Sunday morning, there will be a contract in your mailbox. If you want the job, email us back within 48 hours. Got off the phone, did what anybody would do. I called my parents. First people you call, I talked to my mom. I said, Mom, I got offered a job in Bahrain. Her first question was, where's that? <clears throat> Second question was, is it safe? Then I realized my mom had Googled it and figured out where it was, so I told her to put dad on the phone. I put my dad on the phone <clears throat> and said, Dad, I got offered a job in Bahrain. He said, do you want to be a teacher? I said, yeah. He said six words to me. You're going to take the job, right? It sounds like a question. It's not. It's a statement. At that moment, I decided I was taking that job. That contract showed up in my mailbox. I signed it, sent it back. And about 45 minutes later, I realized what I had done. I had said yes to flying halfway around the world to a country that only 20, 48 hours before I didn't know existed. Part of that yes was getting rid of my car, getting rid of my possessions, packing everything up because I had exactly 25 days to figure out how to get rid of my entire life <clears throat> to move. I had a passport, luckily, because I had used it one time. I was not well traveled. <clears throat> I was not particularly inspired to see the world at this point in my life, nor could I afford it. But with that passport and with the time I had on my hands, I got myself prepared. I landed in Bahrain to the most interesting, fun, dedicated group of people, present company excluded, I have ever worked with. <laughs> now, in that year, I worked with people who would be teachers for one year. I worked with teacher, people who will be teachers for their entire lives. But they made it so enjoyable to do what I did that when I went home at night and there was a stack of grading on my coffee table, when I went in on Saturdays to try and lesson plan, when I stressed out about how can anybody actually get this done, they made me believe it was possible. That one single yes, that school, those people changed my life. Because after that, I said yes to Guatemala. I said yes to new language, new culture, new food, new experience. I said yes to Abu Dhabi coming back here. Um, and coming back to this part of the world was extremely easy because what happens with each yes <clears throat> is that they get easier. The fear of yes, <clears throat> the fear of saying yes to this, for instance, I thought I was going to trip on the way up the stairs, all of those fears go out the window. And what you remember about the yes is the possibility. You remember what is possible. You remember what a yes can accomplish. <clears throat> now, I, asked, I said earlier, you can be anything you want to be. And I genuinely believe that. If you want to know what your future looks like, if you want to know what you'll be, if you want to control it, if you want to dictate it, if you want to do anything, the first thing you have to do is say yes. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk.
Thank you, Mr. Alam. That was very inspirational. Up next is Ahmed Kadir, and he's a student in grade 11, and he will be speaking about the future of technology. Welcome him, please. Good afternoon, everyone. So today, I want to talk to you about something that, that rules our lives every day, something that lets us leave this world behind and step into our own false reality. Something that we feel as if we need in our lives every day or else we won't be able to survive without it. Something that we can't slow down. Something that I think is gonna leave us behind in the next few years. Something that cannot be stopped. Today I wanna to talk to you about technology. My argument is that there's only one decision when we ask the question of yes or no to technology and that's yes. So the question of yes or no is rather a yes or yes question when we come to talk about technology. Technology is a growing problem in our world these days. Notice how I said problem. Well, is it really a problem? We say that there are two sides to every story, but to this one, there's only one. And that is that technology cannot be stopped. We have to be able to keep up with it or one day it will leave us behind. Saying that it cannot be stopped does not mean that it can't be improved. First of all, it depends on how we use technology. I believe that almost every person in the world has some connection to technology in one way or another. As a teenager in the world of today, I can say with complete certainty that almost every person in the world has used or is using some form of technology with the intention of communicating with another person, a community, a society, or a website. As statistics show, just in the fourth quarter of 2017, there were about 187 million people using Snapchat every day. And that's more than the population of Denmark, Sweden, Turkey, UAE, Argentina, and Singapore combined. And that's only Snapchat. According to Statista.com, there were 800 million active users of Instagram only in September of 2017. And that's more than the population of the US, Indonesia, and Brazil combined. And out of all these users, 41% of these users were younger than the age of 24. This goes out to show that most people today that use social media are younger people, and they're mostly young adults. Now that, now that doesn't mean that older generations don't use technology, but the majority of these people are young. From this, we can infer that young people might be able to shape the future of technology. And I believe that if given the freedom of use but kept in the boundaries of ethics, young people can shape the future of technology. And I think they can decide whether in the future technology will develop forward in a positive or a negative way. Every day, the use of technology does increase. Every day, we see technology improving and people discovering new advances in technology. Just in the past 25 years, the world has seen the B2 bomber, the plasma screen TV, spy drones, Google Maps, and even Xbox Live. I myself am older than the tallest building in the world, the iPhone, the Hadron Collider, and the Mars Curiosity rover. As we see the change of technology over the last few years, we can really think that there have been huge discoveries in the field of engineering. If you think about it, most of our parents were growing up without Google. And if it goes down for an hour, we start to panic. That shows us how much we rely on, on, on websites and, and, the, and, and the World Wide Web today to get, to get us through every day. And so this shows us that how, this shows us how much we rely on it. But now if you look at it, we have robots with their own conscience. Now this sounds as, as if it were out of a science fiction movie, but no, this is reality. But can we keep up with it? Some people say that we will get to a point in life where we can't control the advances in technology. And it seems as technology has already left humanity behind. Now take this and imagine if we could control the advances in technology. So should we interfere with it? I think an analogy to this would be nature. We were always told to not interfere with nature, but now we did, we did, and now look. We have global warming, ice caps melting, rising sea, rising sea levels, and extreme weather. But what if we could control all of this? 
We've already seen the control of weather in movies, but what if we could see the control of technology in real life? So to conclude, I think that the next generation and our generations to come are going to get more tech savvy. As we have seen over time, I believe that technology has grown the most out of any field in the world. I believe that the next generations can shape the, which direction technology will take and if they can decide whether technology will guide us or will we guide it. Also, I conceive Technology is going to shape us and make us who we are, but we have, to, we have the responsibility to make sure it doesn't lead us to corruption. To end my talk, I would like to quote the great Steve Jobs. He once said that technology is nothing. What's important is that you have faith in people, that they're basically good and smart, and if you give them the tools, if you give them tools, they'll do wonderful things with them. Thank you. So our next video is a TED video by Matt Cutts, who is talking about trying something new for 30 days. And it's all about having new experiences, as many as possible. So let's direct our full attention to the video. Thank you. A few years ago, I felt like I was stuck in a rut. So I decided to follow in the footsteps of the great American philosopher, Morgan Spurlock, and try something new for 30 days. The idea is actually pretty simple. Think about something you've always wanted to add to your life and try it for the next 30 days. It turns out 30 days is just about the right amount of time to add a new habit or subtract a habit, like watching the news, from your life. There's a few things that I learned while doing these 30-day challenges. The first was, instead of the months flying by forgotten, the time was much more memorable. This was part of a challenge I did to take a picture every day for a month, and I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing that day. I also noticed that as I started to do more and harder 30-day challenges, my self-confidence grew. I went from desk-dwelling computer nerd to the kind of guy who bikes to work for fun. Even last year, I ended up hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. I would never have been that adventurous before I started my 30-day challenges. I also figured out that if you really want something badly enough, you can do anything for 30 days. <laughs> have you ever wanted to write a novel? Every November, tens of thousands of people try to write their own 50,000-word novel from scratch in 30 days. It turns out, all you have to do is write 1,667 words a day for a month. So I did. By the way, the secret is not to go to sleep until you've written your words for the day. You might be sleep deprived, but you'll finish your novel. Now, is my book the next great American novel? No, I wrote it in a month. It's awful. <laughs> but. For the rest of my life, if I meet John Hodgman at a TED party, I don't have to say, I'm a computer scientist. No, no, if I want to, I can say, I'm a novelist. <laughs> so here's one last thing I'd like to mention. I learned that when I made small, sustainable changes, things I could keep doing, they were more likely to stick. There's nothing wrong with big, crazy challenges. In fact, they're a ton of fun but they're less likely to stick. When I gave up sugar for 30 days, day 31 looked like this. <laughs> so here's my question to you. What are you waiting for? I guarantee you the next 30 days are going to pass whether you like it or not. So why not think about something you have always wanted to try and give it a shot for the next 30 days? Thanks. We have Maurice Handy from grade 11, and he will be talking the importance of social engineering. And please welcome him. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams by Jaladin Rumi. 
So, Jaldin Rumi is a 13th century poet and writer. His work was mostly consisted of in the genre of romance and people, talking about how the beauty of emotion and how the unique is our personality. I, dis I discovered Rumi in mid-2007, about 11 years from now, which after I read a book called Ihtisar Sejarah Sastra Indonesia, or in English, it means the history of Indonesian language development. The book was really mesmerized and interviewed me, and believe it or not, Rumi's name was mentioned quite a lot in the book. And as after that, I always ask questions like, why Rumi, why this person, why the generate to people I know and to myself? Asking curiously, well, you know, as a kid, I've always really liked to, to read books and such, and this thing really bothers me at times. And the more I read more books, looking at articles or watch more documentaries, I also stumble upon the word social engineering, which is a concept of social and psychological of an engineering. Give two examples. So I'll give you two examples and I will elaborate later. For example, so when you are a child and your parents ask you to go with them to a shop or a market and then you just looking at something that you like, it could be a candy or snacks and you really liked it and you just tried to get that thing and put it in the basket or just hide it really quietly, not even your parents know about it, and then you just put it in the cashier until it gets paid off and you just take it away. That's one of the social engineering. Or when you just get into a school, like a new school, or just got into from the summer break and you found a whole lot of new people and then you're just trying to be more attractive, more friendly, trying to get more people to know you. That's also one of the examples of social engineering. Because social engineering is a study or a concept that working on the human cognitive development or how our brain develops as we face a situation or people. But the thing is, the more I talk with my friends, not just in school, but also in my Indonesian embassy or badminton team outside of school, people barely recognize this thing so-called social engineering. That to the point people were like, what is this thing? And it actually makes me sad because if we can utilize social engineering to an extent that we can use this to break the fourth wall or we can create a better outcome of our decision, then it's surely a good thing, right? I don't know if you know this, but this, this movie called Yes Man by Jim Carrey, it was published in 2008, about 10 years ago from now. This movie is about a character played by Jim Carrey who, you know, have a normal life and he wasn't really satisfied with his life and he's trying to break the fourth wall, but he doesn't know how to do it. Later, his friend asked him to go to a seminar with him. And in the seminar, he found that about one thing, one little thing that changed his whole life, which is start with a yes. So basically, every time this character are faced with an option, offer or a questions, which requires to answer yes or no, he has to answer it with yes. And every time he answered with yes, his life is changing constantly, getting into a better place up to the point that he get a lover, which he really wanted since the start. I'm not really gonna spoiler the end because I know it's a 10 years old movie, but still, I know it's not really appropriate. But by that little thing, start with a yes, we can create a better outcome in our life that we can change. And this is where also social engineering comes in hand because those little things also consider as social engineering and it is really important for us to get that little things, that key that we needed in order to break the wall or break the barrier that we're trying to find. I'm sure you guys are, have heard this 
phrase all the time, no matter what are the situation. Nothing is impossible. And just let me go back to Rumi's quote for a while, and if I were to paraphrase the quote, I would say, the future only belongs for those that wants to work hard and believe in their dreams. And by saying nothing's impossible, we can also create a new sentence that nothing's impossible if you believe in your dreams and work harder together. Because by working hand in hand with social engineering and working hard towards that level that you've tried to find, you can shape your own future. Because the millennials now are always stuck in the point of, okay, I'm just gonna finish school, I'm going to university and done, and work, finish. And when you get stuck, you're just gonna say, I don't know, this is the end. Like, I don't know what to do because that's not it. Life is not about going to university, work, and done. There are experiences that need to be experienced. There are few places that you need to visit. And those are really important for us, important for our future, because if we not shape our future, then who else? That's why. Nothing's impossible if you want to work hard and believe in your dreams. Because if I can shape my future, so can you. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. That was very meaningful. Next up is Ahmed Azab and Jean Kiernan, who will be speaking about the future of memes, pop culture, and society in general. Please welcome them. <laughs> Whether we're speaking of the information age, the digital age, the millennials, or Generation Z, we're all without a doubt connected to one broad medium called memes. As you've seen these images flooding the internet for past half this decade, here are a few examples. Recency, derived from the word recent. Usually memes are shared by meme accounts, whether it's on Snapchat, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or any, or any other social media website. The spread of memes has increased immensely over the past three years, and it's impossible to measure how many meme accounts are out there right now, since there's several hundreds being created every single day. Now, memes are impacted by this factor of recency. And recency is essentially the popularity of a meme before its eventual death. Now, we conducted this experiment using this meme right here, Savage Patrick which consisted of a screenshot of the, pop, of the popular character Patrick Starr in SpongeBob SquarePants. Now, what we found out through this investigation was that the meme peaked in popularity at 35%, where 35% of our newsfeed on Instagram consisted of that very meme. And only five days after that, the meme's popularity waned down to 20%. Now, this shows the very short lifespan of this meme compared to older memes. This is all to do with trends. Trends nowadays aren't as long-term as compared to perhaps 20 years ago. This is all due to the fact that our technology is much more rapid and accessible than before. Now, this may seem like a negative to our generation since it shows a lack of patience, but it's actually a positive since it shows that we're enhancing ourselves and improving ourselves much quicker than before. Now, arguably, the first meme was this piece of graffiti right here. And the joke was that Killer was there before the Allied soldiers were and it and became a symbol of security. And this meme appeared throughout the theaters of war, such as the Pacific and Europe. Flash forward to the 2000s. Image macros, a very primitive form of meme, which usually consisted of an image and caption in impact font, also portraying a joke or something witty or funny. Then came the age of rage comics, which consisted of very cruelly drawn MS Paint characters. Now, nowadays, most memes can be considered as exploitables, wherein they follow one format, but the content within them can be manipulated. And also nowadays, memes have also become very meta and ironic, meaning that making fun, instead of making fun of things outside of memes, they have started making fun of the very nature of memes themselves. Now on to more modern day examples. We know that memes haven't been around for a long time, but they've been around for long enough for us to realize that they're not gonna die. The amount of memes that could be created are endless. They're a very powerful tool, and this has been very apparent, especially over the past three years. Now, today, memes are used to convey people's opinions. 
And they're also being used as persuasive material in order to comment on important issues such as net neutrality. Now, memes could be interpreted in many different ways. Earlier this year, 60% of the Federal Communications Commission of the USA, also known as the FCC, wanted to end net neutrality. And this idea was sparked up by the chairman himself, Ajit Pai. The, the idea of ending net neutrality was hated by most and admired by only a few. Now, a quick run through of what this concept is. It's simply equality for websites, hence the word neutral. <clears throat> it's where websites with high traffic and low traffic would cost the same to access. Now, the FCC wants to end that, causing websites with high traffic, such as Facebook, YouTube, and Snapchat, cost more to access. Now, memes raised awareness of the situation. Two sides existed, but the majority laid on one end of the spectrum, causing the memes to go against one thing and one thing only, and that's the chairman, Ajit Pai. Memes were used as a method of convincing Ajit that his ideas were bad and that his decision is wrong. It brought the internet together and caused a lot of cohesion between many online communities, since their ideas were all going for that one thing, which is ending net neutrality. Now, politics is something that affects everybody, even if, despite the, even if you're not an active participant in it. Despite being so important to our daily lives, humor can still be found within its realm. And whenever there is something to be made fun of or satirized, memes will thrive. Gone are the days of political cartoons with not so subtle caricatures of political figures and countries. The internet has ushered in the age of memes and politics. Now, memes are not new to politics, but they've only received mainstream attention in the 2016 United States presidential campaign elections. Um, an example of a meme that was used around this time was Pepe the Frog, which started out innocent enough but then quickly became designated as a hate symbol by the far, due to its use by the far right. Now, many people and many meme enthusiasts dislike political memes. They pushed memes away from being this funny and humorous content into more controversial, subjective, and opinionated content. It led to lots of disputes and argument. For example, in this chart, at the time of the elections, it shows that MAGA, which stands for Make America Great Again, Donald Trump, conservative politics, and other political terms were the top searches for memes at that time period. And many people disliked that since memes were losing its humor and becoming more controversial. Now, this shows that memes are no longer isolated to the internet and that the use of memes are having real life implications. The fact that memes have encroached into something so important to us, such as politics, just shows how powerful they have become. Now, through all those examples, we can understand that memes are ever-changing. They're a definitive medium for persons of society to display their distinct standpoints. They're showing a great sign of continuance and no sign of diminishing. And because they are very strong influence on topics as controversial as politics, they never shows that they're never going to die. They can quickly shift views. And for example, this happened to many teens going riding the bandwagon against a Jeep pie during the net neutrality situation. Now, memes have become an integral part of our modern culture and stands as a symbol of this generation and perhaps the future. Memes are being offered in, as a degree in the University of Cambridge and are even influencing things such as politics and music. Perhaps in the future, we will look at memes the same way that we look at cave paintings in France, the hieroglyphics in Egypt, or Roman graffiti in the Colosseum. We live in a society. Thank you. Thank you, Jean and Ahmed, for that interesting speech. Now we have John O'Neill, who's a teacher here at GAA, and he'll be speaking about the power of knowledge and how it relates to saying yes. OK, um, this is my 20th year in uh, teaching. And I don't care what kind of measuring stick you use, 20 years is a long time. Um, in my time in, in education, I've seen a lot of changes, a huge amount of, edu uh, of changes. And almost all of those have been driven by technology. Now, after 20 years of teaching, I think I can only confidently assert one thing, and that's that I'm a bad teacher. I always have been, I still am, and I always will be. Now, I can hear some snickers in the crowd, and I know that you're kind of thinking, well, if this guy wants to get himself fired, why does he do a TED Talk and stand up on stage and do it? And you're wondering why would I make such a claim up in front of everyone else. And the reason why is that I don't fit 
the definition of a teacher. I looked through a lot of sources and the same definition that I could routinely find in all of the sources I looked through is that a teacher is someone who uh, imparts knowledge. And that's not me. It never has been. And you may say, well, you may see this as something that's problematic because they say that knowledge is, is power. But that's a quote that never sat well with me. And I never see that, I don't regard that as a true path to educational success. That definition is tied to a very traditional model of education, one that uh, uses as part of its practice recitation and memorization and cramming for tests. This is geared around a very efficient means of transmitting knowledge, and it's very much a one-way system. And uh, it was one that I never responded to. My own uh, start in education was not great. Uh, my first few years uh, as a student, um, I was given what was called provisional passes, where my parents were called in at the end of the year, and they had to decide whether I failed or was promoted to the next grade. In grade two, I was given a reading assessment where my reading level was rated at, was assessed at a non-reader level. At school, I was passive and I was not engaged in my own learning or my own growth. But at home, it was a totally different story. I experimented, I explored, and I constructed. I eventually did become an avid reader and I read encyclopedias and science magazines. I was a naturally active and curious learner. Even though I just barely managed to get into university, I graduated with high grades and awards. However, at that same time, I experienced some very significant failures and setbacks. Instead of giving up, uh, they seemed to make me more determined and stronger. It was as if I thrived on being told no. There's a growing body of research uh, in education that talks about the, uh, the importance of struggle in growing and learning. Uh, students who experience struggle while growing and learning become more uh, aware of the world around them. They, become, uh, they develop a better understanding of their strengths and weaknesses, and they also grow in self-esteem by struggling through this process. The education and business world uh, are more and more talking about the power of failure as a learning tool. Traditional education models regard failure as an end and a pitfall to be avoided. But when I reflect on my own experience, I think that my failures and struggles were actually the best path to educational success that I could have had. For many years now, educational researchers have been calling for a shift away from an